I ask you to go to the Lord with me again this morning in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, and before your word in particular, I pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would right our minds, that our thoughts would be conformed to your word, that we would hold those things in our mind that are true, that exist based on your word as opposed to our own inclinations or imaginations. We thank you for your revelation that you have not left us in darkness, that although the world around us is in turmoil and darkness, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path bringing us clarity of thought. In Jesus' name, we pray that you would bless us that way this morning. Amen. If we open the message this morning, and I quoted you 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, this way, and said, for money is the root of all kinds of evil. I hope most of you would rebuke me or talk to me later and say, you got that verse wrong, Pastor. It does not say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I could say, well, it does say that if you leave off some words, right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, for the love of money. And so that shifts the problem, doesn't it? That shifts the problem from out there, and in particular from money, to the heart. And no wonder we want to do that, right? To misquote that verse because we're always looking for someplace else to place the blame, right? And it's real easy to blame it on the money. I don't have money. I, you know, and people go on and on. It's not the money's fault. It's the heart's fault. Oh, it's, I'm not as evil as money is, some might say. Or I'm not as evil as those other people. They have more money and money's evil. No, the problem isn't out there. It's in here. But you can see and are very well aware of the fact that that particular verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, and that little word love is often left out of that verse by many who would unknowingly quote it or attempt to quote it. You hear it in the movies, money's the root of all evil. You hear people say it, money's the root of all evil. And this message this morning, by the way, really isn't directly about 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 at all. It's just that that sets for us an example this morning for the text we are going to look at and the broader spectrum of that text. But in using 1 Timothy chapter 6, we can see the problems that fall out from that if you leave a word out of the verse or a phrase out of the verse. The text we're going to examine this morning, and I'm going to ask you to turn to it with me to Luke chapter 2 and verse 14. Luke 2 and 14. And interestingly enough, this particular verse, and I'm going to quote it to you from the King James Version, when it is quoted, is not necessarily misquoted. Most of the time, whenever Luke 2.14 is quoted, it is quoted from the King James, and it has been quoted in multiple movies. It's been quoted by multiple people. It shows up on multiple cards this time of year, and multiple Tudes of times the verse is referred to, it's quoted correctly. King James Version, first, or Luke 2.14 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And you know that particular verse 
has had laid over it a non-biblical filter that has been instrumental over the years in the marketing scenarios to generate what we might call a benign spirit this time of the year. Marketing has used it, and sadly, it's you don't see it much today out there. Uh, primarily, all you see today is big sales signs. Not even the word Christmas often. Not the way it used to be. And that's a sad commentary. But at the same time, we need to recognize whenever we come to Scripture, it is so important for us not to use the world's filters when it comes to understanding it. Because this verse, even though the King James refer or translates it that manner, actually, in many other translations that are based on more recent manuscripts, gives this verse a different translation, which actually captures more of the significance of what is being said here, not to mention the fact that more of the biblical context of what's being conveyed here. Let me read you the verse from the New American Standard. And by the way, this is a similar translation to the ESV and the New International Version and multiple other translations. Luke chapter 2, verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. And we know since the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, there hasn't been peace on earth. The earth has reeled back and forth as it always has since the entrance of sin into the world with wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus Himself promised to us that the closer we got to the time of His second coming, the more we would hear about wars and rumors of wars. That's anything but a promise of peace. The idea of the verse, I believe, is conveyed here is indeed, as this translation puts it, there is peace in the hearts and the lives of those with whom God is pleased. And God is pleased in those who are pleased and in His Son. Pleased in His Son. Because God is pleased with His Son. So important for us to understand the significance of that. And some might say, well, if then Jesus didn't come to bring peace in the world in His first coming, what did He come for? Why did He come? Why did He come? And I want to answer that this morning. I believe that there's two immediate answers with regard to why He came in reference to His birth. Now, we're not going to reduce why Christ came to two reasons. There are multiple reasons He came, and we're going to see several of them this morning. I've listed them there in your bulletin, and we'll go through and look at the verses. And we know that ultimately, whenever Christ came, and we'll come to this, as we have been examining in Sunday school, Christ came ultimately for the glory of God. That's His ultimate reason in coming for God's glory. There are some immediate reasons why He came, and we'll see those. But the first two that I want us to acknowledge that are not in your bulletin there is that the birth of Christ, which obviously is the coming of Christ, speaks first of all to the fulfillment of prophecy. Fulfilling the Word of God from the Old Testament. Turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew chapter 1. As you were aware, Matthew was writing to the Jews. 
to Jewish believers in particular. And he was conveying to the Jews the message of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Matthew was very careful in his writing to point out that the birth of Christ was a fulfillment of what had been spoken in time past. Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 18. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. So he's introducing us to Christ's birth. And he says, When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wait, wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now look at this next verse, 22. He gives us a summary of everything he's just spoken of from verse 18 through 21. And remember, the introduction of this section is the birth of Christ. Now all this took place to, or we could say in order to, here is one of the intents in the birth of Christ, and that is to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Matthew is careful to point out that the birth of Christ and the events surrounding the birth of Christ was in order to, had a purpose to, fulfill Old Testament Scripture. Very important because in another vein, we might reword it and say, in order to fulfill what God promised, in order to bring about what God had said. He does this again whenever you look down to chapter 2, verse 5, concerning the place of his birth. They said to him, and they're speaking to Herod, in Bethlehem. Herod had inquired where was the Messiah to be born. Um, actually, the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired from them, according to verse 4, where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. Move down again in the same chapter to verse 15. Speaking about the uh, flight of Christ from Egypt, notice the text in verse 15, he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what God, or what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. You see it again in verse 17. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Verse 23. And came and lived in a city referring to Christ as a child, a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Very specifically and repeatedly, Matthew points out that Christ in his first coming, Christ in that incarnation, Christ as an infant born of a virgin was in order to fulfill Scripture, in order to fulfill the Word of God. Someone might ask, well, why did Christ come? And we often jump to the end of that, and what we see is the end because it affects our lives most directly, and that is to save. 
And indeed, we're going to see that this morning. But there are many other things that he came to do. And one of those things, by the way, as we will see, was not specifically to spread peace across the world. He came, as we just saw, to fulfill prophecy. He came as God. He came as God. That speaks of the incarnation. God came. So whenever we consider our Lord Jesus Christ in His first coming, we need to understand right off the bat that He came in order to fulfill Scripture and that God was in Christ. That God was and is Christ and Christ is God. Take a look at multiple texts with me. Matthew chapter 1 that we referred to um, already. Verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, for you and I, we read that verse, and I believe sometimes because we're familiar with the Trinity and we understand this, that to call a person God in this day was a powerful statement. You did it at, one, either the praise of men if you were a pagan, and you would refer to an individual as God, and you fell into their pagan camp, or you did so at the expense of your life among the Jews because you were committing blasphemy. But Matthew is very careful to tell us that Christ here is, in fulfillment of the Old Testament Scriptures, God with us. Take a look at some other verses with me that you're very familiar with. John chapter 1 and verse 1. Concerning the incarnation, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh. That's the incarnation. That is in John's writing, is the birth of Christ. He doesn't go into the details that Matthew did and Luke did, but he captures it here and brings the summation of it down to this point. Verse 14, compared with verse 1, the Word, who is God, became flesh. No small statements in this context. John was getting right to the heart of the matter. The Word was God and the Word became flesh. And if that wasn't enough, take a look down to verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. He's emphasizing it over and over. Whenever you go back to verse 14, you can see this even more. And we saw His glory. That's an astounding statement. Because really, and the Jews understood, that the glory belonged to God. And so, whenever John writes and he says, and the Word, who he's already stated was God, became flesh, and we beheld His glory... Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's further emphasizing the deity of Christ in this incarnation. Turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians 2, move down to verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in 
Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As you are aware, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. This incarnation of Christ was in itself a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. God said in the Old Testament multiple times over that He was the Savior and that He would redeem His people. And whenever He came in Christ, whenever He put on flesh, when He became a man, He was fulfilling the statements He had made from long ago. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. Go there with me. Isaiah 43 and verse 11. I, God says, even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. Chapter 45, verse 21. We're just looking at a couple of statements in Isaiah here this morning, but there are multiple places in this book where he referred to himself as the Savior and the Redeemer. Isaiah 45 and 21. Declare and set forth your cause. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. So it only makes sense whenever you come to the New Testament that God becomes flesh that God comes in Christ to redeem His people. And what a praise that He did. Turning your Bibles to another text, Zechariah with me, chapter 10, and there to verse 6. Zechariah 10, 6. Give you a moment to get there. I hear the pages turning. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 6. Another one of God's promises concerning the fact that He is the Redeemer. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them back, because I have had compassion on them and they will be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. God's answer came in the form of that little baby, Jesus. Now, granted, Israel was looking for something much more magnificent, generally speaking. They weren't enthralled with the idea that your Savior is lying up there in a manger around the horses and the cows. But that's God's wisdom, isn't it? As opposed to man's. Well, our Lord, whenever He began His earthly ministry, He gave us multiple other reasons why He came. And we're going to look at some of those this morning. And as we do, we will dispel the idea that He came to bring 
peace to the whole world in His first coming. And that that verse that we have examined, Luke chapter 2 and verse 14, has actually a much richer and more significant meaning in it in that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ. But let's begin by first acknowledging, and we won't necessarily, we'll take these in the order that they're listed in your bulletins, but not necessarily in the order that they're listed in the Bible. And what we're going to look at is six reasons why, and I believe there are some others, and even some of those others can be uh, folded into these, uh, but let's acknowledge clearly some of the things that Christ said he came to do. And the very first one is, he came to do God's will. He came to do God's will. And that really ultimately speaks to all of it, doesn't it? Because whenever Christ came, he came not to do his own will, although his own will was in complete agreement with everything that he did, he came to do the will of the Father. John chapter 4, verse 34. <clears throat> you remember the setting. Jesus is visiting with the Samaritan woman at the well. And the disciples had gone out to get some food for him. And they returned. And Jesus said to them, My food, in verse 34, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Wow. Two things there. To do the Father's will, John 4.34, and to accomplish His work. That's why Christ came. Why was He born there in the infant? He, as an infant in the, and placed in the manger? To fulfill prophecy. To fulfill the fact that God is the Savior and He said He would save His people. He would. And He came in flesh and He was there as a child, an infant, a man, a young, a human, to eventually go into a man. And as he did, he said, I have come to do my Father's will. My meat, my food, my sustenance, all about my life is geared toward this one thing is the significance of that statement in John 4, 34. To do the will of my Father and to accomplish His work. John 5, 43 I have come, Jesus said, in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. Now that's an interesting statement. Whenever Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name, he's saying, I'm in essence coming to do all that I do to his praise and to his glory. I'm coming according to his will, to his purpose to accomplish his desires. And notice there's a contrast to that. You do not receive me. You see, he didn't come in his own name. He didn't come to accomplish something apart from what God had sent him to do. He didn't come in the name of humanity. He came in the name of the Father. And that sets the world against him. John 6, 39. For I have come down from heaven, Jesus said, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 39. He came to do the Father's will. Whenever you move in your Bibles to John 12 and there to verse 27, you see a statement and prayer of our Lord. He said, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, 
save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Verse 28. He came to do the Father's will and to accomplish His work for the purpose of glorifying the Father. Whenever the writer of Hebrews speaks of Christ, he refers to a text from the Old Testament. And the text is quoted in Hebrews 10.7, says, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the roll of the book it is written of Me to do Thy will, O God. The first thing that we need to recognize with regard to our Lord Jesus Christ and His coming is the fact that He came to do the Father's will. He came in addition to that to fulfill the law and the prophets. We mentioned that already in the uh, preceding points of fulfilling prophecy in the Incarnation, but I want you to see it clearly as a statement from our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5. Look to verse 17. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think, Jesus said, and by the way, this is His Sermon on the Mount, the first recorded message that He preached. And it says in verse 17, as He instructed the people, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I didn't come to abolish them. I didn't come to set them aside. I didn't come to nullify them or to contradict them. I came to fulfill them, both the law and the prophets. Christ came to bear witness of the truth. He came to do His Father's will. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He came to bear witness of the truth. Look in John chapter 18. Verse 37. John 18 and 37. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king, Jesus answered. You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. So he's given us a reason why he's been born, why he's come. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Wow, what a powerful statement. I've come to testify or to bear witness of the truth. And that's a a subject within itself here insofar as Christ bearing witness of the truth. That encompasses many, many things. One, as we've already seen, that He is God in the flesh and God said, I would come and I will save. And He has come in Christ and He indeed saves And he bears witness to the Old Testament truth that all are sinners, right? That truth that's as true in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. And that the wages of sin is death. And Christ died. And in dying, he was paying the wage for someone else, for others. So there is much in that. Mark chapter 1, verse 38 Mark chapter 1, verse 38. This has always been a very interesting verse. And you can see the context of it for a moment with me back up to verse 32. 
When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him, that is to Christ, all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were with various who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Well, why were they looking for him? Well, we know why. Back up in the text. He was bringing health and healing and casting out devils, wasn't he? The people had a great need. They were sick. And we don't want to minimize their illness. They were possessed with devils, some of them. And we don't want to minimize the misery that that caused them. But at the same time, notice what Jesus said to them in verse 38. Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. He came to bear witness of the truth. He came to preach the truth. Now certainly he came and you can see in the Old Testament that there were prophecies that indicated Christ would bring healing to the sick and he would cast out the devils. But he's saying here ultimately, I've come to bear witness to the truth. I've come to preach the truth. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, the Bible says. Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 8, 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? You know... We live in that culture today that doesn't want to offend anyone. As a matter of fact, I don't know how you can read 1 John and not see the stark black and white of Scripture in this epistle written by the disciple who's referred to as the beloved one. The beloved disciple the one who spoke most or much about love. But notice what he says here. The one who practices sin is of the devil. He's just categorized all people who are lost in that statement. And he's saying if they are practicing sin, they haven't been delivered from sin, they're still under the bondage of sin, the answer to their cause behind that, or not necessarily just the cause, pardon that, but the one behind that is the devil. And you're a child of the devil. Notice this. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. And here's the reason for His coming to destroy the works of the devil. Now, in this context, it's beautiful because the first place that Christ works to destroy the works of the devil is in the hearts of men. The devil's still active. Contrary to popular belief among many who profess even to be Christians today, he's not bound He's still as loose as he ever was. The New Testament bears that out. He's not held up someplace. He's still in the world. The Bible repeats that time after time after time. Peter said, your enemy, the devil, is going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
if he were bound someplace, if he were held up in a cave or a chasm or an abyss someplace, that verse would not make any sense. Nevertheless, Christ did destroy the works of the devil. If you're a Christian this morning, you've been delivered from the domain of darkness. What a praise that is. His works have been destroyed. You've been cut off from Him now, and you are brought into the kingdom of the Son. What a praise that is. The devil doesn't have the authority over the people of God anymore. We're delivered from his domain. Praise the Lord. And why? Because Christ has destroyed His work in our lives. His hold on us. Christ came for judgment. Take a look in your Bibles with me to John chapter 9, verse 39. Now this isn't the ultimate judgment that's necessarily in view here, although some aspects of this pertain to the ultimate judgment, but what we are acknowledging are the clear words of Christ that His coming would result in judgment. John 9, 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world. It can't get much more clear than that. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. And really what he's addressing in this is the fact that there were those around him, and we know them generally by name as the Sadducees and the Pharisees and some of the scribes, that they felt they were righteous, but it was a self-righteousness. They thought they could see, and they disdained all those who were not in their camp. And Jesus said clearly, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see, that is, those who aren't self-righteous, that they may see. And that those who see may become blind. Jesus in Luke chapter 12, look at verse 49. Luke 12, 49. Still speaking to the fact that Jesus spoke of coming for judgment. Luke 12 and 49. I have come to cast fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have come to cast fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Matthew chapter 10. And verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. Was Jesus contradicting the angels from Luke chapter 2 and the text that we read in verse 14? Certainly not. The angels that are the elect angels, only speak the truth. But here Jesus says, don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. And then he explains that in the next verse. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now in this context, 
And you can see it spelled out in verse 39 where he's going to actually explain verse 38. He says, He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. So whenever you back up in this text and you look at verse 37, he says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whenever he comes to verse 38 and he says, And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He's saying, He who loves his life more than me is not worthy of me. And so Christ's whole point is saying, I haven't come to bring peace, but my coming is going to be a sword because that sword is going to bring division right down into your personal relationships. He came for judgment and he said that he did. Next, he came to save. What a praise. What a great blessing He came to save. As I said, this is the one we often jump to and, and we forget about the rest. And, and why it's important not to forget about the others is because many have jumped to this one. And coming to this last fact, He came to save at the expense of all the others Many, especially even in churches, have made great compromise of the gospel because they have sought to somehow or another accommodate the world in order to bring peace into the world at large, perhaps. Their misunderstanding, we could say, of Luke 2.14 has led to a compromise of a multitude of other verses that speak clearly to the opposite of their interpretation of Luke 2.14. He came to save. Luke, or excuse me, John 12 and 46. Jesus said, I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. There's division right there, by the way, isn't there? If you believe in Him, He's going to take you out of the darkness. And beloved, God takes the darkness out of us. Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. John 10.10 10. We're very familiar with this text. Jesus says there that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's the devil's way. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. All of his ambassadors have the same agenda in mind. Regardless of how sweet and nice they speak, their end is to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, though, in the rest of John 10.10, 10, I have come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. What a praise. And finally, in Luke 5.32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came to save and praise the Lord that He did. And how He saved was by going to the cross. By offering His body to God as a living sacrifice. And He died on that cross. And in His death, in regard to things, as Hebrews 2 says, pertaining to God, He satisfied God's wrath. And in the satisfaction of God's wrath, 
he reconciled to God people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Praise the Lord. And God sent His Holy Spirit into the world according to Acts chapter 2 to bring that message home to the hearts of the elect of God. And He's doing that right now. This very day. All across this planet as the message of the Gospel goes out. We know that God still saves because we are exhorted by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 to regard the patience of our Lord. That is, the second coming and the delay of that second coming or what we perceive to be a delay of that second coming, we are to regard it as salvation. As God saves His people that He chose in Christ before the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. Whenever they are saved, truly then we see the significance of that verse. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. Because in that salvation... There is the experience of peace with God. And as a result of that peace with God, Philippians tells us that we have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, all comprehension. What a praise that is, and what a blessing. Let's not minimize those other reasons why Christ came. They are equally valid, equally important, and must equally be conveyed because they are truth from Christ Himself. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Jesus. Thank You for His coming. Thank You for Your purposes in Him and the fact that He has indeed done Your will and that perfectly. I pray that You would bless us with the knowledge of Christ and as we, this season, remember the Incarnation, remember that first period in time where He became a man, cause our hearts to rejoice in the fact that You keep Your promises and nothing will thwart Your purpose. In Jesus' name, Amen.